Great to have you back for another episode, which happens to be the 229th already of ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And we're broadcasting live once again from the opposite, we should say, beginnings versus ends of the world with uh, you, DeSoto Brown, in your Bishop Museum in Honolulu, Hawaii. Hi, DeSoto. Hello, everybody, and hello, Martin. And me, Heidi Soto, wouldn't you wish so, still back in Munich, Germany? So well, I, I'd um, rather be in Honolulu, thank you. You, you all can right. be in Munich, I'll be here. You're welcome. I thought you wanted to ski with me, you just said. No, 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 no. <laughs> all right. So we're, we're still um, uh, reporting uh, under the uh, three th threats of seas, which is climate change, COVID coronavirus and civility through increasing civil unrest through social inequity. And architecture certainly has to do with all three areas. And that's very critical. And speaking of critical, uh, let's remember some people who were, we remember as very critical minds on the island who were not afraid to address issues like that. And one of them is very familiar to you, DeSoto, because he is your architect, right? Who is that? His name is Vladimir Osipov, and he's a famous mid-century architect of both commercial buildings and private homes. And he is the person who designed the home that I grew up in and will be moving back into at some point in the future from 1948. So I know very well the work of Osipov. Mm -hmm. And about one and a half decades later, he declared the war on ugliness, which was, of course, a peaceful yet powerful kind of professional declaration of that he didn't want to put up with what he saw was going on in the big building boom uh, era around him, where he tried right. to be more sensitive than he thought others. And then uh, another person we just recently um, thought about again, uh, his name is Chris Smith. And Chris Smith uh, in 2005 on a convention provoked the audience. He was on a panel and he said, can anyone here design an interesting building? And, you know, most architects would probably vainly say, oh, yes, my buildings are very interesting. But to put it in perspective, what he might have meant, he is the architect, for example, of the HMSA, which is my health insurance, by the way, not that it matters, but on Kamoko Street. And the goal was, uh, as rumors say, and we will look more into that in the future, that the uh, determining factor for the building was not formal, but performative, because he wanted that no sun, which is problematic uh, in Hawaii all the time for keeping us cool, is ever going to pass any glass. So that being said, again, he had a performative versus a formal approach and might have meant the interesting more performatively. And then about a decade later, a Kurt Sandburn, uh, who wanted to be called in the show I did with him, uh, most activist journalist, in 2016, one of his final uh, articles was labeled, When Protection Fails, an Ugly Honolulu Emerges. And that basically, you know, he had been living in San Francisco for a while, uh, but Civil Beat basically uh, told him that because he's not on the island, you know, he's not qualified to uh, talk about what's going on in Honolulu, which really, um, you know, pissed him off, excuse the term. And so Kurt, hope you're well. We have to get you back uh, one way or the other. We miss you. And so here we are, I guess it's the Soto, you and I, who have to uh, do that here and now, right? Because for right now, wants, yes. who else wants to, right? <laughs> and let's, let's get the first uh, picture up for that, because we want to operate in the tradition of uh, the three mentioned gentlemen who are heroes from the past in, in regards of architectural criticism, uh, because they were... Uh, Howleys, right? They were not from here. Uh, right. Osipov, we have to add, was genetically Russian, and uh, he grew up in Japan. And so the two other ones are basically American, and, and Kurt grew up on the island. But Chris, I don't think, 
he did, and he moved back, I believe, we believe, to uh, San Diego some years ago. So again, we keep believing that being partly off and removed from the island, as I occasionally are, is a good thing. And it opens your eyes. And you confirm that when you know you share the stories that I bring from other places that all of a sudden you know, gives us a, a clearer perspective. So right. to that regards, what we see in here is from the last summer when I was following our cross-cultural connoisseurs, Joey and Clara, to their stay in Barcelona. And up there is uh, when I arrived at the airport, Joey basically said, oh, you just, you know, grab a cab. And I said, hey, son, you know me. I don't do that. I hate cabs. I'm a public transport guy. I want to hop on a train or a bus. And I found one. And that was an express bus that only took had two stops. And doesn't the, the distance and the location up there at the top right that I Googled reminds us of back home? Well, you were saying that this was probably a trip comparable to going from the Honolulu airport to Waikiki, where you live when you're here in Honolulu. And yet you are able to get on this bus and, as you said, make only two stops and get there not only very quickly mm -hmm. and very directly, but you were also able to ride in a bus which could accommodate your your bag, your suitcase, and it lets you off right where you needed to be. And you pointed out that if you were to try to take a similar trip here in Honolulu on the bus, you would not only not be able to carry luggage, a piece of luggage, you'd also have something like 29 stops you figured before you got to Waikiki. So in the case of Barcelona, you had a much more direct, much faster and much more accommodating way to get there than you would have if you had tried to do it here in Honolulu. All right. So something to learn from that. But never mind. Let's jump the bus, which I did last time, and I did the 29 stops. And you know, the, the bus driver was kind enough to take our big luggage last time. So thank, thank you for that. So uh, let's jump the bus and ride the bus. Let's go to the next slide. And before I'm almost home, this is about the second to last stop before my uh, Waikiki Grand. And uh, this is basically then getting us uh, through Kohio Avenue. And Kohio Avenue is the, is the sibling of Kalakaua Avenue that runs parallel to it. But they are of very, very different nature, right? Kalakaua is our glitzy mile. And Kohio at least was, and it's changing dramatically, which we will talk about, is, has more gritty grain. Is that fair to say? Yes, it is. And one of the reasons it ended up like that was because in 1971, because of traffic, uh, Kalakaua Avenue and Alawai Boulevard were each made one way. And Kuhio was left to have two-way traffic, which makes it a lot more congested, not as smooth, not as calm and nice as the traffic on Alakawa is. And I think that's one of the reasons it seems more gritty, in addition to all the other things that you mentioned, like the photograph of the homeless person, which is in the upper left uh, on Kalakawa Avenue. They do sweeps regularly. They clean things up. There are people sweeping the ground literally all the time. So you do not see that as much out there where the expensive stores are. And yes, there are very high-end stores lining Kalakawa Avenue. Yeah, and there are some new developments on Kohio. One of them we reconvened when our exotic escapism expert Suzanne was with us, and you choose to take her and me to Denny's, which is That's at the end right. of Kohio and Kapahulu. Right. And so, um, and, uh, one more slide, next slide. Uh, that we have been recently on Kohio a lot. Uh, the bottom right is the show quote when we were out of our quarantine, but I still was only with the Department of Health and my university uh, health services uh, emails that I you know, had sufficient vaccination and the restaurant that had no problem with that was Paya, which is on Kohio. And it's in the building, it's the base of the building where our friend Ron Lindgren was put when he was uh, with you, a keynote speaker on the National Adoka Momo Symposium, which you see at the very top right. 
And the one who gave the name to the street, we see at the very bottom left, right, Soto? Tell us right. who that is. That is Prince Jonah Kalaniana Ole Kuhio, and Kuhio Kalaniana Ole, pardon me. And he was an important person politically. And the reason you pointed out very interestingly that in this statue, he is dressed in Western clothing. And that was because he was a delegate from the territory of Hawaii to the Washington, to the National, uh, you know, United States Congress in Washington, D.C. So, of course, he had to dress that way. In this statue depiction, however, he's also wearing a shoulder cape of feathers, bird feathers, in a traditional Hawaiian style. You asked why his statue is not on Kuhio Avenue that's named for him, but instead on the beach. And I was able to tell you that that was because he had a home on the beach. And in fact, that's why this stretch of beach at Waikiki is called Kuhio Beach. So he's there uh, where his home was. But as you pointed out, he is totally overdressed. And the woman who is walking past him is dressed much more appropriately for the setting. Yeah, let's just assume he was undressing himself as well when he was back home on that. He was. He was. In that house, he did. Brian. <laughs> he did. He did. So, okay. So now from your treasure box of uh, historic photographs, Next slide, and the next in the next couple of slides, you will show us the history of this particular part of uh, on Kohio Avenue that uh, has just been uh, gotten redeveloped. So right. that's how it looked back then, right? Right, and so we are going to look at the place that we're talking about, which has a new structure that's going to be the focus of what we'll be talking about in this show and for some others to come in the future. And it's this corner, which is the corner of Kuhio Avenue on the left and uh, Kane Kapole Street on the right. This is property that belonged to Queen Emma. She was the wife of King uh, Kamehameha IV. They are the people who started Queen's Hospital, and her property in Waikiki is the Queen Emma Estate, which helps support Queen's Hospital. And until the 1950s, this large piece of property was not developed. And in fact, they didn't even construct roads through it till 1954. So you see here the fairly new roads in 1957 without anything built on the property, but you do see there's an abundance of trees and there's a big banyan tree back there that we're gonna be looking at as this little story continues. Let's go to the next slide. And here is that same piece of property as it looked after the first building was built on it in 1960, and that was a supermarket called the Food Pantry. The Food Pantry not only fulfilled the needs of regular people in Waikiki who lived there, but it also had a gourmet section, which I always remember as a kid was very intriguing because it had a lot of weird types of food in it that I'd never seen before, such as a bottle containing a rattlesnake so that you could eat rattlesnake meat. Nobody mm. ever bought that bottle containing a rattlesnake. But you'll notice mm. there's the food pantry on the left, but the build, but the space on the right is still empty. And you'll notice in the background, there's that big banyan tree. Let's go to the next slide. And yeah. which, this is is a, zoom, which is zooming in, right? Which is zooming in. And again, here is the food pantry, which was there until a short time ago. And that's going to mm -hmm. be something that has something yeah. to do with the the development we're going to be talking about and, and talking talking performative right uh, this is a very utilitarian building type but you know a fine mid-century one because there's performative measures as the canopies that shelter you from the sun and the rain and then there's this interesting sort of like double facade kind of fake front thing that you see at the very left so indeed mm -hmm. You know, did you say that was a Pete Wimberley by any, is that right? You know, I don't, I was no. just trying to remember. It was by somebody significant and I think it was Wimberley. Okay. So again, that's a totally utilitarian building but it still has these nice mid-century touches mm -hmm. and it opened in 1960. Let's oh. go to the next slide. And this is that big banyan tree that I was talking about that was already on the property. When this was developed, the banyan tree was left in place and there was open space around it as well as a parking lot. In the late 1970s, as there was a plan to redevelop the property then, people suddenly rose up in anger when half of the tree got cut down 
in, pro in getting ready to get rid of it entirely. And there was so much quick and sudden uh, anger about this in the community that they stopped cutting it down and they left it, which is why we are gonna see it is still there today. But this is as it appeared in 1965. Let's go to the next picture. And this is the other building which was built on this same piece of property next to the food pantry. This is the Royal Theater, which opened in 1964. I went to a number of movies there, which I remember very well, including The Godfather in 1972, which you see is on the marquee right then. And I vividly remember going to this theater to see that film because it was so good. Yeah. The Royal mm -hmm. Theater was demolished in the 1980s, and it was replaced by a restaurant called Banyan Gardens, which, of course, made reference to the Banyan tree that I've just been mm -hmm. talking about. But that eventually closed. It was turned into a lower-end re restaurant, and then the property was entirely cleared on just this corner, and there were food trucks and other types of temporary food sellers there. Yeah. So and, this corner and the, went through some changes. Yeah, yeah, and The Godfather being a mafia movie theme, as we know, yeah. Yeah. You know that's appropriate and suitable for Kuhio because Kuhio is not just gritty grain, but also has you know some some rough sides, right? There was absolute crime. There's prostitution. And you know, it's it's the other side of Waikiki that we see. The building, another very nice, fine, tropical, exotic piece of architecture again, with a sort of row of slab posts there, and then these kind of canopies that remind us of Queen Emma Garden by Yamazaki, yep. uh, again, um, and providing sufficient shade and shelter uh, from the elements. Very nice piece of, as you said, utilitarian but exquisite tropical exotic architecture, and too bad it's not there anymore. And right. when we go to the next slide, this is how we recently remember the site when everything was demolished for quite a while. Uh, the food pantry was still there, right? Until yes. until recently, but large yes. parts of the block were basically and and be, uh, before the redevelopment, um, they they used it as for sort of a more mobile sort of vendors yeah. and when. Joey and Clara were on their uh, culinary uh, shaved ice trip to Malta. That was an inspiration when Suzanne and I took pictures of the shaved ice vendors and gave them some clues about, uh, you know, practice um, uh, back back in Hawaii. And and next slide, the tree. You know, and everything has changed, but the the tree has always been there. And was obviously one of the prime things to save, you know, although land is very valuable in Waikiki, but uh, luckily um, that one survived, you know, predator capitalism uh, so far, so good. And on the next slide, and these are pictures uh, you uh, gave me because I was not on the island when, when that happened. Uh, you can see there is quite some rubble and quite some stuff. So the tree had to go through quite some challenges there. Correct. And, um, and this this is where the food pantry was. This is yeah. after the demolition of that building. And I believe that the new building, the Lilia, which we're about to look at, because it has a supermarket or a market in the in the ground floor of it, I think that that was partly one of the justifications for them being able to build it was yeah. to replace the food pantry with a large food store because Waikiki has a lot of people in it and yeah. that was the only supermarket. Yeah. And another justification slash deal we're going to get to in the next couple of slides. Right, right. Yeah, so also on the site, but across the street, but still on the Queen Emma property, in the early 1960s, when those other buildings were built, these small two-story walk-up buildings or three-story walk-up buildings were also constructed with low-income or low-cost apartments. And instead of demolishing those, as part of this building being built, the new building being built, these 1960s buildings were refurbished, and that was done so that the development was fulfilling a requirement, a zoning requirement or a permit requirement to include lower cost rental apartments. So they are functioning 
as part of the deal which allowed the high rise to be constructed. It has to have some lower uh, cost apartments in it as well, but that number was reduced because these other buildings were kept. Yeah, and we're obviously as docomomers, we're happy mid-century gets saved. However, if you want to be nitpicky, uh, at the top left, a show quote from many years ago, almost half of a decade now, uh, 2017, the two of us did a show that was called Sun Slated Hawaii. And what's so iconic about it are these vertical uh, wooden slats that cover the staircase. And in that one, and we took these pictures back then, there were also the guardrails. So I'm wondering now if this aluminum guardrail sort of is a retrofit or you know an interpretation. Right. But in any case, again, overall, uh, they're pretty much kept in the original and that's a good thing. And, right. and next slide, they're comprised of several buildings. So it's not just one, it's, 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 a, it's a couple of them that we see here. And we see it in the final execution up there, picture we took in at the bottom, we see the renderings by the developer. And they're sort of depicted as sort of hip, as you can see, you know, our automobiles architecture show to be continued in the future. You see that Ford Bronco, a pickup with a surfboard, you see the Vespa, you see a T1 VW bus and an American a car down there from mid-century. So obviously mid-century seems to be hip again, you know, which, which is good, which, which helps to, um, you know, keep uh, the appreciation of it. And, and uh, next slide, talking, talking hip and Howley at the same time, uh, probably the most iconic one, which is not on Kohio, but it's sibling Kalakawa, is what our exotic escapism expert Susanna, as being representative for many others, says, this is the building I like the most, as this is the Bank of Hawaii and by Pete Wimberley. And again, he was not from Hawaii, but he chose to live there and work there. And he did a pretty good job in saying, I want to build not like where I come from, but I want to adjust and adapt to these very specific uh, conditions of tropical exotic, which he did. Uh, next slide. Um, Ron Lindgren, who is not physically with us because he chose so, but he will be with us by his opinions that he um, allowed us to quote, and we will. And Ron, we know you're one of our favorite viewers, so hopefully we can lure you in uh, being a special guest in the, uh, in, the, in the next volumes of this one here. And one thing you said is is rightly so that usually, uh, unless it's like a stark architectural branding with Richard Meyer that we will get to, oh, there's actually, he is there at the very top right. Uh, the architects don't always play a significant role in the developments. They seem more like the facilitators. And at the top right um, is a, a project that got pulled, which is on uh, Alamona Boulevard by Howard Hughes. That was supposed to be Richard Meyer. And the gentleman you see at the very top left uh, with hair was me at the age of what my emerging generation is now uh, in the mid 20s. And when I was in the prairie at the University of Nebraska, we did something that I miss so dearly and I feel bad that I don't do it with my students because of just the remoteness we have and the room being so removed from the landmass is doing a quick trip, which took us Actually, you know, with airplane, you can almost be as fast, but it's more costly. But there we were able to hop into a car. And after eight, nine hours, we arrived in Chicago, which is where that building at the bottom is. And that was in the early 90s, the hottest thing uh, or one of the hottest thing that was there, which doesn't seem so hot, which means that was a little lost in the early 90s. And that was what we thought was Richard Meyer, but it was actually a firm that was sort of maybe copycatting Richard Meyer, and that is uh, Solomon Cortwell Buens, as it says up there. Recently, this project um, has been remodeled uh, pretty much back to its uh, original by Starbucks. And you see an R on the, on the right side of the building. So this is one of the few Starbucks reserves that only few cities in the world have. This is a special brand within the Starbucks brand, and they do special brewing with special coffees. 
And so Tokyo has one, and obviously Chicago has one, and Hawaii has one. And where is that one? It's even on Oahu. It's even yeah. in Waikiki, but yeah. it's probably in Kalakaua, right? No, because unlike what we were just saying, where all the high-end stores are, and, and Kalakaua today is, you know, it, it's notorious for these incredibly expensive uh, European-based mostly stores that are, are designer stores. But our Starbucks Reserve is not on Kalako with all of those, you know, the Tiffany and the Hermes and the Louis Vuitton. No, it's on Cuyo Avenue. So Cuyo Avenue has been upgrading itself in recent years. Um, it's gotten cleaned up a great deal. And while there still are pockets that deserve to be cleaned up, a lot of stuff has been done that makes it a lot more friendly and a lot more walkable and a lot more things to see and do that aren't quite as sleazy as some of the stuff used to be. And so we get to boast that we have a Starbucks reserve as well, although it's not quite as huge and noticeable as the one in Chicago that you are looking at right now in this slide. Yeah, and it's on the corner of Seaside and Cohio in the, what was it called, Waikiki Trade Center or something like right. that. That's yeah. correct, which is so now a hotel. Which is now a hotel, that's that's right. And and these things are both good and bad. They're obviously good because they raise kind of the level, you know, of and and and, and but it's also gentrifying. The reserve, yeah. you can still get your coffee. I mean, Starbucks coffee is, is costly to begin with. And in a reserve, the normal coffee is actually not more expensive than in other stores, but then, you know, the very special brews in there sort of are. Anyways, I, we're at the end of this appetizer talking uh, Starbucks here, a little taste of uh, what we're going to continue next week. And we're going to start out uh, to reveal that the island already knows the architect, Solomon Cortwell Buens, because they have been active on the island before. But that one we have to save and will for next week. So see you then for volume two of uh, the Lilia Living Wall Waikiki. And until then, stay very tropically exotic. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.